Bird. I'm an environmental analyst with the Office of Climate Change in the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Welcome to the Exploring Climate Solutions webinar series. On Earth Day of this year, Governor Malloy issued an executive order creating the Governor's Council on Climate Change, also known as GC3, to examine the efficacy of ex existing policies and regulations designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to identify new strategies to meet the state's emissions reduction targets. The Council is composed of 15 members from state agencies, quasi-state agencies, businesses, and nonprofits. To learn more about the GC3, please go to www.ct.gov slash deep slash GC3. As part of the Council's effort to explore alternative models of climate leadership and climate analysis, this webinar series explores innovative and successful climate change solutions in Connecticut and across North America. The series provides first-hand accounts of high-profile municipal climate programs, climate initiatives in the corporate world, greenhouse gas reporting frameworks, statewide sustainability programs, and low-carbon fuel initiatives. Today, we're excited to have Sarah, please, I, I'm going to have to ask you to pronounce your name. I forgot to check beforehand how to do it. <laughs> Sarah Alexak. Thank you. Apologies. Mm -hmm. uh, no problem. Sarah is program coordinator of the U.S. DOE's EV Everywhere Workplace Charging Challenge. The Charging Challenge aims to achieve a tenfold increase in the number of U.S. employees offering workplace charging for plug-in electric vehicles, or PEVs, by 2018. Many PEV drivers do their charging primarily at home, but access to charging at the workplace can help to double their vehicle's all-electric commuting range, increasing the affordability and convenience of driving an electric vehicle. The challenge is open to U.S. employers of all sizes whose charging stations are or will be primarily for employer employee use. Pardon me. The challenge offers benefits to employers who are considering installing charging stations, as well as to employers, employers who have already launched a charging program. This webinar will provide an overview of the challenge and the benefits of workplace charging. Sarah's presentation will be, about, will be about 35 minutes long, and then we'll take questions from the audience. If you have a question, and we invite you to have questions, please submit a question using the chat box or question box on your screen. We will read the questions aloud, and Sarah will respond. Before we get started, a note for those of you who are listening via your computer speakers. If your sound quality isn't up to par, we encourage you to call in using your phone instead. Sarah, I want to thank you again for your willingness to share the story with us. I'll now turn it over to you to start. Thank you so much. So the first thing that I'll say right off the top is that it, for all of you on the line or in the room today um, that are listening in, um, Connecticut is one of the leading states as far as workplace charging goes in terms of the support that the state is doing to promote workplace charging. So I'm going to talk today as if you know maybe a little bit about workplace charging, maybe you don't, but just know that your state is already um, being uh, serving as a great leader, so I'm glad that you're devoting some time on today's call to draw attention to the topic to a wider audience. Um, but then also acknowledge what you're doing in your own state already. So um, at DOE, so I'm with the Department of Energy in Washington, and here we work to promote the national economic and environmental security of the nation, and one of our biggest, biggest threats to that security is the high consumption of oil. About 9 million barrels of oil are imported to the U.S. every day. So that means that half, more than half a billion dollars goes overseas um, or out of our country every day. So three out of every four of those barrels of oil is used in the transportation sector. So to really address this issue, um, we here at DOE really have a great uh, focus on reducing the petroleum used in transportation. Now that's speaking mostly to the um, economic security of the nation, and then obviously um, today we're talking about climate solutions, so we very much acknowledge um, a tr transition off of petroleum or reduction in petroleum um, to increase our environmental security as well. So one of the ways that we're working on reducing petroleum is by replacing it with a more efficient domestic fuel source like electricity. So the President's efforts with electric vehicles all fall under this larger initiative called EV Everywhere. EV Everywhere is the President's grand challenge to American companies to make the U.S. the first in the world to produce electric vehicles that are both as affordable 
and convenient for the average American family as uh, the gasoline-powered vehicles um, that they uh, would normally purchase by the year 2022. And we're doing this effort um, across a number of cross-cutting um, avenues, and a few examples are uh, we're working with utilities in a grid modernization consortium on transportation electrification. It's really um, taking this opportunity to work with utilities and talking about how electric vehicles are going to be impacting the grid and what we can do to be prepared for that and look at the opportunities that exist there. We're drawing attention to the value of electrifying transportation through a lot of outreach efforts, um, increasing consumer awareness about the benefits of electric vehicles and just how the technology works, really basic EV 101 stuff. And another example that we're talking more about today is supporting the deployment of electric vehicle charging infrastructure at workplaces. So we really have to ask right off the start, why the workplace? You know, why are we focusing on this um, as our key charging infrastructure area? Um, so employers are really the ones that are positioned to build the charging infrastructure that outside of the residence, so non-residential charging, in the place that it's meet, needed the most. Second to only the home, the workplace is where PEV drivers and their vehicles spend the most of their time. Um, drivers park their cars at workplaces for six and a half to eight or more hours a day, meaning that workplace charging demonstrates that largest infrastructure gap or opportunity um, for PEV charging. And when we look at that, you know, that's kind of the theoretical, but when we dive into the data that we've been able to collect through um, the EV project, which some of you might be familiar, it was a massive effort back from the Recovery Act that we're still making great use of the data that came out of that project. Um, we deployed over 12,000 uh, charging stations, and uh, the data that's been collected from 8,000 Nissan Leafs and Chevy Volts is up on the screen. So we looked at where are people actually in reality charging their vehicles, and uh, we looked at 250 work sites, and we found that um, Leafs and Volts that were parking and charging at work had the opportunity um, to uh, really, between 32 and 40 percent of their charging was done at work, and only 3 to 4 percent was, were done, was done in um, public locations like shopping facilities um, or other public charging opportunities. So. Um, while those places, we definitely you know, want to emphasize that there's um, importance for public charging. Um, it's what folks are going to recognize and they're going to see this network of charging infrastructure that's out there available to them. When we look at where it's actually utilized and where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck, it's at the workplace outside of the home. So since we're talking about climate efforts today, um, and how workplace charging can fit into that. I wanted to show you this chart that we put together when we were thinking about how does workplace charging really stack up against other things that we're doing to reduce GHGs from employee commutes. So we're talking about um, bike, van pull, and transit subsidies. And of course, this slide has a lot of assumptions behind it, but what we ended up finding is that for the dollars um, invested in these various opportunities, the amount of CO2 equivalent reduction that we were getting per dollar, um, workplace charging is really comparable to, and in some cases greater than, bigger bang for the buck, other commuting options. So um, this really helps kind of show that money being put into this area is having, um, it does have a great potential for um, GHG abatement compared to our normal um, transit subsidies. So um, a really great factoid that I like to always highlight off the top is, you know, why Connecticut is thinking about workplace charging and why they need to think about workplace charging. And this is um, a statistic that just came out this year from our program. Employees that have access to charging stations at work are going to be six times more likely than the average worker to drive electric. So we know that there's um, really a strong uh, correlation between folks that are driving electric and workplace charging. So keep that in mind today when we're thinking about if we want to promote workplace charging in Connecticut or if we want to promote electric vehicle adoption in Connecticut, we've got to promote workplace charging. So 
When we're talking to employers and when you're all out there thinking about how we're making this case to the employers in, in the state, um, you really have to have a strong value proposition. So first we want to talk about why workplace charging is valuable to their employees. So not only does workplace charging address um, a need for many PEV drivers that are currently driving, it gives them increased range confidence so that they know that if they run, need to run some errands during the day and they want to make sure they can drive electric on the way home, then um, plugging in and charging up at work will, will really help them be able to do that. And it also increases the electric vehicle miles traveled. If your employees are driving um, a Chevy Volt, for example, that has um, a gasoline hybrid engine with that battery, um, if they charge up during the workday, they don't need to kick on that gas engine for the ride home. And that helps them get um, a greater return on their investment that they made in that electric vehicle. And it's more electric vehicle miles traveled, so you're not burning that petroleum. Um, and we call the workplace a second showroom. So the benefit for potential PEV drivers is that when they see their coworkers and their colleagues driving electric and plugging in, they start to talk to them about that new car that they're driving, what, um, how it's really working for them. It's people that are similar to them in terms of um, probably lifestyle, pay, um, their experiences, their commuting habits. And if it can work for them, then maybe this can actually work for me. And we've, we've seen this time and time again that um, workplace charging is really impactful for folks that might not be as familiar with the technology um, and they might start thinking more about how, workplace, how driving electric could work for them. So what is the value for employers when you're talking about workplace charging? It's not just employees who are really reaping the benefits of this. So here at the Department of Energy, we've collected the stories of over 250 employers that have workplace charging, and we found time and time again that the value proposition for workplace charging is really quite solid. So employers consistently characterize workplace charging as a valuable employee incentive, a win for sustainability efforts, and a signal of corporate leadership. So looking at how things shook out in an annual survey that we issued to these 250 employers, um, and I'll talk more about the, those employers later in the presentation, um, we found that 95% of employers are receiving positive feedback from their staff. Their staff are excited about the charging infrastructure, and they're really seeing it as um, a significant benefit for them. Collectively, these employers saved 1.7 million gallons of gasoline, 17 million pounds of GHG emissions um, over the past year. It's equal to removing 2,250 cars from U.S. roads. And lastly, 70% have noted that they're receiving recognition for their workplace charging efforts. They're either getting credit in sustainability uh, uh, programs, recognition programs, they're getting credit in local media, they're getting credit from local uh, civic leaders about what they're doing by installing charging infrastructure and supporting their employees. And 60 percent of these employers are really acting as leaders and they're acknowledging their role in their leadership role. They're stepping up and helping other employers in their industry and in their region with the development of their workplace charging programs. So let me tell you a little bit about our program here at the department, the Workplace Charging Challenge. As was mentioned earlier, we have a goal of getting 500 employers publicly committed to offering employee charging by 2018. So as of today, we have 257 employers and we're about halfway through the program, so we're really on track, um, but we have a lot of work to do. Um, I think we, had a, we have a lot of momentum at the beginning and we need to see that continue. These employers um, have six, over 600 work sites where they have charging infrastructure already installed. And at those 600 sites, they have over 5,500 charging stations accessible to 9,000 EV driving staff. So um, we're really excited to meet the halfway point of our program. And we've, like I said, we've got a lot of work to do. So I'm going to tell you next a little bit about how our program is structured. So from the DOE side, our, um, the reason why we feel like we've been successful with this program is we've built it off of a voluntary partnership model 
that has worked well for DOE in other areas like building efficiency. Some of you might be familiar with our Better Buildings program, and this program is really modeled off, off of that program. So for our part, DOE provides employers with technical assistance. We recognize their success, and we've established a network for best practice sharing. And part um, employers who are willing to publicly commit to providing employee charging can join the challenge as a partner. So they voluntarily communicate their charging plans and they share their progress with us by responding to that annual survey that I mentioned earlier that we get data out of. It's a really pretty basic survey, um, but it's a really good way for us to stay apprised of what's going on um, with workplace charging in the country. So employers that are interested in signing up as partners, they may be companies that um, organizations that already have charging or are looking to install charging in the future. There is no requirement on the number of charging stations. Um, there just has to be at least one charging station. And another one of the criteria is that this is really, really focused towards employee charging. So those charging stations have to be installed with the, the main purpose of providing charging access to staff. So, um, Organizations that aren't involved in our program are um, restaurants, hotels, the like that are offering work, uh, charging more to customers and clients than their own staff. So here's just a snapshot, nice logo slide of the um, over 250 partners that we have. It ranges from large corporations to universities, small businesses, um, really all across the board, workplace charging, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So each one of these um, organizations has a very different approach. And you'll see that there are also um, cities, states, counties as well that have signed on. So let's look at Connecticut. When we drill down into our, our partner map of what we have going on in Connecticut, you see Eastern Connecticut State, GE, GM, LaGrande, MetLife, um, the Hartford, and University of Connecticut all have charging infrastructure for employees uh, in your state. So I want to take a minute just to spotlight a couple of these examples and what these partners are doing in your state. So first up is the Hartford, and I have to say that I have a soft spot for the Hartford because they were one of our really early um, partners, and they've been just fantastic in sharing their experiences and always willing to call in to different webinars that we put on for other employers um, when we need folks to reach out to employers to talk about one-on-one -on -one with some of their experiences. The folks at the Hartford are always really willing to do that. Um, they, uh, in 2011, the Hartford installed six charging stations at campuses in Hartford, Simsbury, Windsor, and Windsor, Connecticut for a total of 12 charging stations. The Hartford offers free charging for its employees, and they see workplace charging as an important part of their company's goal of a 20% GHG reductions um, between 2010 and 2017. So this is really, workplace charging is built into uh, the Hartford sustainability strategy. Next up is Eastern Connecticut State. As part of the university's commitment to sustainability, um, it installed its first level two charging station in December of 2014. So there's two um, charging spots there. And it's located in the main parking garage of um, their campus and the charging stations available also free um, for university employees um, and students and the public. So you know, this is an example where employees definitely have access to it, but it's also open to um, students as well. And this is, that's a similar pattern that we're seeing at a lot of university campuses. And lastly, LeGrand, um, in alignment with, the, with their sustainability commitment, um, the company also has free EV charging um, to employees in support of their efforts to um, choose low carbon transportation options. And they started uh, their charging program in 2011 as well. And they have originally started in West Hartford and has since expanded to other states. And, New Jersey and New York uh, for a total of ch seven charging stations um, across the three states. So um, I'll just mention here that you do often hear stories of Google or Cisco. Cisco has a thousand EV driving employees, but 
starting small is not a bad idea, um, and that's something that there's really significant wins and opportunities in just installing a few charging stations to start and then seeing where it goes from there and um, seeing how your campus um, or your employers is in the state campuses can really spur that EV adoption. So I mentioned that DOE is providing technical assistance to employers and we do this through a number of ways. Um, we offer uh, employer resources, um, we have a lot of content on employee engagement in our employee outreach materials. So once those charging stations are in the ground, how can employers act in the role of engaging employees and helping to educate them about PEV benefits and the technology? So we're really seeing a lot of employers step up to that and really integrate it into their sustainability engagement efforts and on their, um, at their work sites. We've got a ton of case studies. As I mentioned, we've got 250-some employers. When you go to our website, there's a partner map, and you can zoom in on all across the country and find out what employers are doing um, in their areas at their sites for work, offering workplace charging. We do a quarterly webinar. We host, um, we have our next ones coming up later this week. Uh, we support the um, various organizations in offering workshops. In fact, we just we just released a workshop sort of in a, in a box toolkit um, on how folks can put on their own workshop to educate employers in their areas about the benefits of workplace charging and all of that content is posted on our website. We do a quarterly newsletter and then um, really a lot of our time is just one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with employers. We don't send people out to the field to visit work sites, but we field a lot of questions and we, we help connect um, employers in our network uh, so that they can talk to others about their, their experiences. Just highlight a couple examples when I talk about these technical resources. What I'm talking about is actual um, deep dives into specific topics that employers are going to come across when they're looking at workplace charging. So the first thing that an employer is going to want to do is assess the demand. Maybe they have one employee who has said um, really like to have some charging stations or maybe they're on this call or maybe they're, you know, thinking about installing workplace charging. Well, one of the first things they can do is issue um, a survey to employees to find out how many employees do they have that are driving electric right now and how many might be more interested in driving electric if workplace charging was installed. And from that, you can really uh, have a data point to begin this process with. You very well might come back with no one drives electric and no one's interested and that helps you really understand that maybe workplace charging isn't right for you. But um, we have a sample employee survey up on our website. We've got an incentive database and equipment guides for charging infrastructure, a sample request for proposal that employers can send out to charging infrastructure, uh, charging station providers, um, guidance that focuses on um, ADA and charging signage that they're going to want to put up. And we've got a lot of content on charging program management. So how is your workplace charging program going to be um, administered? How are folks going to register? Are you going to charge a fee or are you going to provide free electricity? And what happens when you have five EV drivers and two charging stations? So we have a lot of examples of different charging station sharing policies. And as I mentioned, we've got a lot of content on employee engagement and promoting workplace charging. So um, a lot of that content is also up on our website and available. So how can Connecticut promote workplace charging? As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Connecticut is already doing a lot to promote workplace charging. So um, the DEEPS uh, EV Connecticut page has a wealth of great resources, including links to DOE's content, so you can just go there to connect to our material. It's a great place to start. DEEP has already held, um, at least that I'm aware of, one workplace charging workshop um, this past summer, and I heard that that went really well and was really well received. And um, continued employer outreach is really key. Um, thinking about how Connecticut can tap into existing stakeholder networks um, 
you know, how, where do facilities managers, sustainability folks, transportation coordinators in Connecticut, where do they get their information? Um, chances are that these folks might not even be familiar with the benefits of driving electric or installing charging stations at, um, on their, at their work sites. So um, tapping into those existing networks and getting information about workplace charging sent out through those channels is a, is a really good place to start. Um, holding more workshops in different areas around the state is helpful. Getting employers to attend and participate, whether it's through webinars or in workshops is really key. So getting those right contacts and like I said, tapping into those existing networks can be really beneficial. Um, I'll also mention here that I know that Connecticut has an incentive for employers for workplace charging stations, which many states do not. So Connecticut is definitely very progressive in that department. And uh, more information is available on this website that I have up on the screen, the Energy Environmental Protection EV Connecticut website. I believe that the incentive for workplace charging, I'm sure someone else will chime in a little bit later, is um, it really it ends at the beginning of January 2016, so there's really just a small window left. And with that, I'll end and um, open up, uh, well, for uh, questions that, that folks might have. If you haven't already typed them in, um, please do so now. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity um, to talk about workplace charging to you all and uh, raise the profile of workplace charging. That's really what we're after here is um, showing this snowball effect that employers are out there offering workplace charging it is not um, some futuristic idea and that, that it's having a positive impact at many workplaces across the country. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, this is Carrie Ann Reichato from uh, the Climate Office. I'm the director here, and uh, thank you so much for um, your presentation. I think this was really informative. Um, we do have questions coming in, so I'll go ahead and read those aloud to you and uh, have you respond. Um, and to those on the line, uh, go ahead and, and continue to send your questions in, and we'll get through as many as we can. It looks like we have plenty of time. So does, to start with, um, does DOE promote sourcing the electricity from renewable energy? That's a really good question and something that we get asked a lot. Um, how, what, what is the actual GHG benefit um, if you are, you know, pumping in this electricity off of a dirty grid? And, and how, how do we know if it actually ends up being better or worse on the environment than burning petroleum? So um, to get to your, your question, we don't have a policy that states that employers should pair it with renewables or purchase renewable credits. However, what we do see is that many employers are doing that. They're acknowledging um, the amount of electricity that they're consuming and then they're buying credits or they are pairing it with solar at their facilities or other renewables at their facilities um, to make um, you know, more of a, a net zero impact. But one thing that we're helping employers do is do some calculations with them and help point them to the right informational resources where they can find out what is the fuel mix, what's the, the carbon um, that, you know, the GHG emissions that um, they're getting from their local grid, you know, how clean is their, their local electricity supply. That's something that um, many aren't exactly familiar with, so we kind of help them through that process in thinking about that. Um, obviously up in the Pacific Northwest, you know, you're, you're, you've got a lot of hydro up there, but um, when you look at other states, it's, it is certainly different, so they need to be weighing those options. Great, thank you. Uh, and then just to the, the end of the slides there, you uh, mentioned Connecticut. Connecticut does have some funding for um, public um, workplace charging stations. Um, the current amount of funding um, is from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, and depending on how many um, applications come in that utilize that funding, they, there will probably be a round, a, another round, um, you know, with funding uh, availability. Um, and with Great. that, the question, the follow-up that is, is there federal funding for charging stations? It's a good question. There used to be. There currently is not. 
Um, and when I say this, uh, I should mention this is I'm talking about workplace charging um, stations, but that's also true for residential. There used to be um, a credit available for that. There is um, some measures being discussed on the Hill right now, and we're watching those closely to find out whether or not they will pass in 2016. So there is a possibility, you know, the, the, the conversation is on the table over there, and we'll see that it, if it does go through, there's a lot of um, backing for that incentive. So we will be really putting the word out if that incentive does become available at the federal level. There is still federal funding for um, incentives for the purchase of electric vehicles, however. So um, we're glad to say that that still is available. Great, uh, and I just, I actually want to point out that there's Connecticut funding for the purchase of electric vehicles. If you're not familiar with what those incentives are, we uh, encourage you to go to the website that Sarah showed you earlier, the EV Connecticut cheaper website. It outlines um, which vehicles uh, would receive different levels of funding. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely check that out. Um, a few more questions here. Um, does a company or organization have to be a certain size to participate, like X number, you know, at least 500 employees or something along those lines? Yeah, no, we have um, employers that are as small as a staff of like five or 10, and then we have giant, giant corporations. So there's really no size restrictions. And we're seeing some of the most exciting stuff out of the small businesses. And and I think a lot of times the reason for that is that it's, it's a personal passion for the owners of those small businesses, and they know that they're having such an impact on their employees. They're, in, in the vast majority of cases, they're the ones that are driving electric, and then you know they're helping their employees um, as well. And, and that kind of is one interesting thing to point out is that a lot of employers are offering an employee incentive for driving electric. They're offering three, five hundred, a thousand dollars for employees that um, choose to buy an electric vehicle. Um, some of them are offering special loan rates through their organization's credit union. And they're doing other things like that to help incentivize their employees' purchase of an electric vehicle. So that's been really um, interesting to watch over time, the, the different employers that are doing that. Okay, great. Uh, what type of charging station are you seeing installed most frequently? Level one, level two, fast charge? You know, it's a really good question. Um, we have a, a webinar later this week um, on the release of our um, progress update, uh, our mid-program review. And one of the questions that we asked employers was, um, just that, what, what level charging station are you installing? I don't have the stat in front of me from this year, but I can tell you that um, as a, that uh, last year, well, I can pretty much off the cuff say that, that overwhelmingly we are seeing employers install level two stations. However, we advocate, or I shouldn't say we don't advocate for anything, but we, we educate employers on the benefits of level one and level two. So for folks that are on the call that might not be familiar with it, the charging stations, 240 volt is what we're looking at with a level two. Level one is 120 volt, and it's like your regular wall outlets. So um, I think that what we're seeing is that employers are choosing level two stations because um, really, that's what's being sold to them. That's what um, folks are out there pounding the pavement selling. And, and there's a lot of benefits of level two stations. Employers oftentimes really want to be as hands-off as possible with managing these things. They don't want to have to deal with collecting a fee. They, they, want some, they want a readout of how much electricity was consumed, and they want to know what is their, you know, GHG reduction impact. They want that, you know, um, they want that app come up, you know, to come up on their screen and be able to show them all of this. They want a message to be able to be sent out to employees to let them know when a station's free. So there's a lot of benefits that come with a smart um, charge, a level two charging station that, that can help folks with that. Um, 
However, those are much more, um, can be much more expensive than the level one solution. So I'll, I always give the example of Coca-Cola and at their headquarters in Atlanta, I was able to go down and check this out. They had, um, they have over 80 EV driving employees there and they knew that the 1Z, 2Z level two stations that they were installing wasn't making the impact that they wanted to have, but they also wanted to be uh, mindful of Oh, we of just the notified Sarah that we've lost her audio. Um, we'll give it another minute here to try to get her back on okay. the line so we have uh, can answer a few more questions uh, if you're willing to, to bear with us. We'll, okay. we'll uh, hopefully wrap up in a, in a couple of minutes. Sure. Hi, we're having difficulties on the deep end. Uh, we're unable to hear the audio. 
So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up or uh, with one last question. Um, thank you, Sarah, for your time, and sorry about the tef technical difficulties. <laughs> um, the last question is, as more and more employees buy EVs, how should uh, entities participating in the program um, deal with free electricity in the workplace? Hey, sure, that's a um, really great question. This is Sarah again. And um, some of, uh, so right now there's about 80% uh, of employers are offering free electricity that are part of our program, and only 20% are charging a fee. And we're really watching to see if that changes over time because we think that um, the addition of a fee will be something that can impact uh, the, the sharing of electric vehicles and prioritizing for the folks that need to plug in at work um, the most and allowing them to have access to those charging stations. And so I think that um, we're going to start seeing that more frequently that folks do sh make a shift to charging a fee. And, but for in areas where employers are really looking to incentivize, um, and if there's not a lot of EV driving employees, offering for electricity to their staff is a really great benefit that they can provide to them. So I will just close, um, since we're ending now, I'll we'll close with saying that if there's anybody on the line that is aware of employers that are not yet on our map that um, have workplace charging or would be good candidates for workplace charging, let's work on reaching out to them. Um, I'm available, I'm, you can reach me at Workplace charging at ee.doe.gov. We'd love to hear more about any workplace charging that's going on in Connecticut that we do not already recognize. So we want to recognize more Connecticut employers for their efforts. Um, thank you all so much for calling in today and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Sarah. We're, our audio is back, but we'll go ahead and end with that. And I just want to let uh, folks in the audience know that the Exploring, this is the last session for uh, 2015 for our webinar series, um, but we've had some positive um, feedback and we will continue to offer um, webinars into the new year, um, uh, probably on a le less frequent basis, but um, beginning in January, we will have a couple that we will be putting out notices about soon. So please stay tuned, keep checking our website. Um, this has been a great resource and have a great day.